The um, next panel um, is going to use a conceptual framework of crime. And I think that in some ways that allows us to look at um, uh, perhaps the, the harshest practices, uh, to think about why uh, they happen, um, about the motivations of uh, state crimes uh, being perpetrated. Um, it allows us, of course, also to think about responsibility and uh, blame, and then um, potentially, um, I'm sure that's um, uh, a, a hope we could start with, um, it might allow us to think in terms of legal responsibility and uh, legal liability for some of the practices um, we have started discussing this morning. Uh, of course, uh, uh, there will, I'm afraid, uh, be many challenges and problems as we consider these issues. Um, and I think that um, uh, I would just like to mention at this point, um, as um, a, a China lawyer, Ava Pills, based at King's College London, I would just like to mention that um, uh, from a domestic Chinese law perspective, uh, it is in my view, and other scholars have also made this point, uh, it is entirely possible to say that some of the practices such as the incarceration and in so-called training camps and uh, the, uh, according to um, more and more evidence, more and more testimony we get, um, practices of torture, for example, are crimes under domestic Chinese law. Um, the problem, of course, with that is that um, there is uh, no court, there is no process uh, through which we could possibly uh, pursue legal liability for these crimes. Uh, therefore, this panel will, um, uh, 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 with, with experts um, who are real experts on uh, Uyghur uh, studies um, and on state crime and um, criminology, uh, international crime, this panel will um, sort of discuss um, uh, the issues in terms of uh, a broader conceptualization of crime, uh, as well as from a comparative and international angle. And um, following the practice of the morning panels, I would like to invite each of the speakers um, just quickly to introduce um, yourselves. Thank you so much. And we will start with Joe. Definitely. Yes, please, please. Uh, uh, would you like to um, perhaps go over and, and because you have a PowerPoint. <clears throat> okay, so um, is that on? Yeah. So thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you to the organisers for the stellar work you've done in bringing um, all of these experts together. Um, it's fantastic to be here. Um, I'm Jo Smith-Vinley at Newcastle University. Um, I've been working on the Uyghurs since about, about 1991, I think, um, for a long time on evolving Uyghur identities, so ethnic national gender identities, uh, and more recently forced by circumstance to start looking at um, issues of Chinese state terrorism. Um, in, in, in the context of re-education in Xinjiang and now um, since about last summer starting to look at cultural genocide, genocide, crimes against humanity and, and things like this. Um, I'd just like to add that I'm here today in a personal capacity because uh, I am actually taking part in UCU industrial action for um, fair pay, pensions and working conditions. So I'm, while I am affiliated to Newcastle, I'm not here on, on behalf of Newcastle today. So. Um, last summer I started thinking about genocide and cultural genocide. Um, I, I was at a conference in Australia where a few of us began to talk, think and talk about the, 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 the concept of genocide in, in the context of re-education. Um, and a colleague, Anna Hayes, um, in sort of going through a, a number of different concepts, mentioned um, Bradley Campbell's work on um, genocide as social control. And this is what really spoke to me. Um, and the reason why it spoke to me in, in the Xinjiang context is because um, it is about correction. It's about correction of deviant behavior. So, 
it focuses on the perpetrator's view that victims are evil, victims are criminals, victims are deviant, uh, and therefore they need to be corrected in some way. Um, and we see this. Um, so Campbell, in his work, gives examples of mo the moral grievances of the perpetrator. So perpetrators of genocide accuse their victims of being disloyal to the nation, of taking over and infiltrating, of being parasites and living off others' labour, of producing children that will become a potential future threat, and also even of attempting genocide against them in reverse. Um, and those of us who are following um, online conversations on Chinese Weibo will know that many Han people are online claiming that it is in fact the, the, the Muslim perpetrators who are attempting genocide against the Han. So just to zoom in on two of those, two of those which I think most speak to the Xinjiang situation. So Campbell gives the example of Nazi Germany in the 1940s where Jews were routinely accused of disloyalty to the German nation. Um, we see this in um, Chinese state discourses, media, state-sanctioned media discourses, as in the one you see here in example one. Um, and to focus in on a second one, um, again, Nazi Germany, Jews were believed to have taken over German culture, and we also see this idea of infiltration in Rwanda in 1994, whereby Tutsis are deemed to be clannish, um, exclusionary, um, and have infiltrated all aspects of um, Rwandan society. And we see this in, for example, the regulations on de-extremification here, this idea of halal, infiltrating, expanding, interfering with other people's secular lives. So, yeah, so this idea of corrective re-education, um, we see this a lot. If we look at the language, we look at the discourses, we see the, the idea of doing things correctly, correcting behaviours, correcting beliefs all the way through the documentation. So this is taken from the, the infamous regulations on de-extremification from 2017. This next slide, this is taken from the recently leaked Xinjiang papers. Um, again, we see all the way through this, we see the idea of um, correction, correcting erroneous thinking, even eradicating erroneous thinking. Um, making people recognise their mistakes, and so on. So what does correction look like in practice? Well, we know that um, it, has, it involves breaking up families and communities, sending cadres into homes to identify extremist behaviours, um, and that this ultimately ends up in the internment of one or both parents, which disrupts reproduction and disrupts cultural transmission by separating the parents from the children. Um, and uh, another form of correction is uh, correcting the, the Uyghur um, endogamy rule. So Uyghurs usually will um, choose not to intermarry with Han Chinese, but in the current situation, because of the atmosphere of fear and terror of being interned in a camp, um, women are currently being forced into uh, this situation where they must accept um, a marriage with a Han Chinese person. And this is a very famous picture that was caused quite a storm on, on social media because of the, the sheer um, humiliation, uh, really, on, on the Uyghur bride's face. So what else does correction look like? Well, places, religious places have been corrected. Um, so mosques have had uh, data doors put outside them. This has terrified people into not going into the mosque anymore. The mosque has been corrected with a Chinese flag, with um, digital screens with running propaganda on about um, legal versus illegal religion, correct religion versus incorrect religion. Um, neighborhood mosques have been covered in... Um, yeah, neighborhood mosques have been covered in framed pictures, framed prints of the, the um, regulations against extremification. Um, the Arab, Arab, Arabic calligraphy has been torn off the front of the Haitkar Mosque in Kashgar, you see there above the doorway. Um, these are all forms of, of correction. Um, and one a very extreme example on the right hand side there is where a neighbourhood mosque in Kashgar was actually turned into a cafe bar where um, when I visited it in 2018 Han tourists were drinking alcohol, uh, coffee, um, etc. Um, <clears throat> how else does the correction take form? Well, first we have empty mosques and then 
um, it emerges that actually the state has been disappearing the mosques entirely. Um, and we have satellite technology, um, which ha has shown the, the disappearance of, of some very important mosques, like the Keria Mosque we see here. Um, this is a shrine I visited in Bashkirim, just outside Kashgar in 2018. It was completely empty, devoid of, of visitors, pilgrims, um, obviously no votive messages hanging in the trees or anything, completely padlocked up and barren and, and desolate. Um, but soon after I made that visit, again, more evidence came out via satellite that um, other, other shrines were being, not, if not completely raised, then at least having their most important religious buildings um, deconstructed, destroyed. And I think these two quotes really speak to, to the situation. One of them by Raila Dawood, who is a, a very important Uyghur folklorist who, as we speak, still remains disappeared and hasn't been seen at all uh, in person or on video for a couple of years now, I think. Um, and then most recently, as Aziz mentioned earlier, in, in his own personal case, the, the raising of Uyghur graveyards. So a lot, of dis a lot of corrections taking the form of eradications, eliminations, disappearances. In terms of culture, um, we see the imposition also of Han secular culture, as, as in these pictures here, um, where you have Chinese lanterns and Chinese um, couplets, spring, spring festival couplets attached to Uyghur doors. In many cases, it's the Uyghur families who are themselves putting them up in order to demonstrate their patriotism, in order to demonstrate their loyalty. Um, so, you know, um, forms of self-censorship, like, like Darren was talking about earlier. Um, we see it also in the, the beautification project in, in um, Urumqi, um, Lianghua, uh, as the, the Chinese call it. So, um, whereby all of the sort of ethnically distinct Uyghur architecture that has been um, put up by Uyghur shopkeepers is being torn down and being replaced by this kind of standardised... Um, hand-constructed um, pseudo-Islamic architecture. Then with language, um, we've seen the gradual eradication, uh, disappearance of the bilingual ed education policy and replaced by a national language policy, uh, a Goyu, Jiaoyu policy. Um, uh, in this picture here, you can see the Arabic script has been, has been literally cut out of this poster outside um, uh, an Urumqi primary school. The project I'm working on at the moment is, is to do with this set of six primary school textbooks. Um, these have been revised. The, first, the previous edition was from 2015. These ones are revised in 2018. Um, and what we find in the new versions, the new editions, is that Uyghur culture, Turkic and Islamic culture, has been completely taken out. The only thing remaining in the textbooks are a few proverbs here and there. Um, the word Islam is completely absent, as is the ethnonym Uyghur. There are no Uyghur personal names used in any of the texts, although they sometimes appear in the exercises, in the drills. All of the human characters in the texts have hand names or foreign names. Um, and throughout the books, inner Chinese geography is highlighted, but Xinjiang geography is completely um, absent. Uh, and there are only a very few references to Uyghur place names. So again, a disappearance and invisibilization. Um, an invisibilization of the Uyghur people as a separate group and nation, and of Xinjiang the place as a separate homeland, if you like. So all of this makes me think of tabula rasa. Tabula rasa is um, a concept taken from studies of frontier genocide. So um, reading Benjamin Maidley's article, he gives, he looks at three examples um, that of gen frontier genocides that took place in different times in history and in different parts of the world. And he draws together a pattern. Um, and uh, one, of the, one of the things he um, recognises, he, he identifies, is this policy of tabula rasa, or creating a map scraped clean. And this really, this, this is really what I see happening in, in Xinjiang. So <coughs> scraping, scraping Xinjiang clean and Uyghurs clean of Uyghur identity and Uyghur culture um, in order to facilitate dispossession uh, and ethnic cleansing. Um, and this idea of, of the land being empty or made empty, you know, this dates all the way back to the 2010 Xinjiang Work Forum, after which we began to see these adverts on the Beijing subway. If you were travelling on the Beijing subway, I know David Tobin was um, at the time, he also saw these um, 
you will have seen these pictures of, a, of an empty Xinjiang, you know, an empty Xinjiang where there is almost no, there are almost no people. Um, and these were put up by the Xinjiang Construction Production and Construction Corps, and they were essentially adverts to Han migrants to move to Xinjiang, yeah, to go to Xinjiang. It was, it was an incentive for, for Han migrants to move in, move into the emptied land. Yeah. So settler colonialism um, becoming much more explicit from from this time onwards. And I think I'm going to stop there because I think I'm going to let Penny speak to this. Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you very much to, uh, to the organizers of this conference to invite me. It's, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Andrzej Klimesh. I work as a researcher in Czech Academy of Sciences. I've been working on Xinjiang since uh, 1999. Uh, I did my doctoral research on uh, Uyghur national movement uh, before 1949, and uh, lately I've been working uh, on a one project unrelated to Xinjiang and uh, on Xinjiang ideology and propaganda system. Um, I uh, decided to focus just on uh, two specific points about the debate about uh, whether uh, we can call the crisis in Xinjiang genocide or not, because we've heard a lot of information in previous presentations. So uh, I decided to uh, emphasize just two points. But uh, firstly, I think there is a debate about whether we should have the debate, uh, whether events in, in Xinjiang are genocide or not genocide. There is a lot of arguments uh, or a lot of people argue that uh, this, uh, this crisis should not be called genocide. Uh, it's been argued, uh, these are quotations from an article actually, uh, that the concept of genocide is a has been uh, highly politicized by the West, used, by, used for a political agenda. Uh, I found this quote, a uh, critic of China's policies and practices would be best served by focusing on actual problems. Uh, of people uh, experienced by people living inside the region, etc. Uh, I think uh, we as uh, scholars uh, should uh, agree on a terminology which uh, at least to label what's going on now. I'm not trying to speak about whether it's possible to prosecute in terms of genocide or in terms of uh, uh, crimes against humanity and uh, I will try to present some factual um, some, some facts which, which uh, I leave up to discussion by legal experts whether they can be used as evidence or they are insufficient to be used as evidence. Nevertheless, I think we have the responsibility to agree what, uh, how to call uh, the events going on in Xinjiang. Uh, because as, as was uh, mentioned several times here before, the, there is a, an unprecedented form and uh, extent of the repression which is going on in Xinjiang. Uh, but I think at the same time the trends are, they have uh, sim a lot of similarities and they are continuities of a uh, number of past phenomena either in Xinjiang or in uh, People's Republic of China or in China or in other places of the world. And they are, uh, they have many similar traits with other genocides and crimes, crimes against humanity. So I think uh, the responsibility lays with, uh, with uh, experts to establish uh, whether we can or cannot call it genocide or crimes against humanity, especially now in the situation where there are two completely uh, different worldviews being presented in the debate when uh, concentration camps on the one hand are called schools, on the other hand, or uh, potential genocide or crimes against humanity are being called a successful model of anti-extremist policy. So I think we have the responsibility to find uh, terminology for the sake of having a discussion, not meaning discussion with the, with the People's Republic of China because the limits of discussion are, are uh, or the possibilities uh, of discussion, I'm, I'm quite skeptical, especially in the situation of Xinjiang. I think uh, 
the experience or the situation shows that uh, um, campaigning and pressure is probably the best way of uh, interaction or most efficient way which bears actual results instead of uh, attempts at dialogue. Uh, it has been also pointed out in, in the uh, relatively few articles I, I've read on uh, genocide or works on genocide uh, that there is a conceptual nexus, uh, uh, not only conceptual, between uh, genocide and colonialism. I think there is also a strong connection between genocide and uh, totalitarianism or totalitarian rule. And this, I think, uh, is especially uh, prominent in contemporary uh, People's Republic of China, where in many aspects we see uh, sort of a great leap backwards. Uh, many uh, totalitarian era policies are being resurrected and perfected, updated uh, for the context of 21st century, uh, such as mass detention uh, combined with re-education, combined with forced labor, uh, all of it uh, greased by high, uh, newest, highest technologies. Uh, so I think it's, uh, it's important to also pay attention to, to this nexus or linkages with, with uh, the evolution of political system. Uh, also, I think one level where it's very prominent, as, as was shown just now by Joe's uh, presentation, is, is a political discourse of, of the People's Republic, where we see a clear, clear revival of uh, totalitarian binary dichotomic discourse, uh, as the research, for example, by Ti Feng Yuan, who, did, who researched language of uh, cultural revolution, or by essays by uh, actually, a Czech, uh, Czech uh, um, dissident, dissident, uh, Czech dissident on Czechoslovakian communist discourse, who argues that totalitarian discourse seeks to split the uh, discursive world and therefore also the real world into two halves: one white versus black, correct versus incorrect, healthy versus. Uh, infected, etc. So I think this perspective of totalitarianism, or uh, is is a very very valid, uh, uh, very pardon, very valid, uh, varied um, framework which we can use looking at contemporary Xinjiang. Um, Lemkin uh, perceived uh, genocide as a synchronized attack on on uh, different aspects of life of uh, a particular victim nation. I will focus on, on uh, cultural genocide, uh, on one aspect, let's say, of cultural genocide, so that's uh, inflicting, um, um, inflicting terror or mental pressure or mental damage, psychological damage or waging psychological war against uh, the particular community. Um, I think uh, destruction or decimation or various uh, similar meaning uh, or words having similar meaning are uh, also apt to use in this context despite the fact that they are just they are uh, quite strong uh, because I think a lot of the elements of uh, what is called officially strike hard campaigns uh, or people's war on terrorism, uh, liberation of thought uh, in previous historical periods, so called de extremization, modern modernization, beautification, uh, sinification of religion, uh, terms which uh, is used also re engineering of, of uh, Uyghur and other minorities, uh, uh, social structures, uh, transformation, etc. It implies or it shows that uh, it's uh, conditioned by actual destruction and obliteration of the existing situation and replacing it with something new. So, hence my uh, choice of wording. Uh, so, uh, applying mental pressure, uh, coercion, uh, state terror, as il illustrate, uh, il illustrated by Joe in her article, um, creating atmosphere of fear. I think, uh, I think it's, it's very important, of, or one important facet of the synchronized attack on, on the particular victim group. It's also uh, stipulated in the Convention of Genocide. Uh, which m can mean also causing serious mental harm to members of the group or to the group as a whole. So I think um, a lot of um, a lot of uh, data shows that, that that the situation really does exist 
on ground in Xinjiang, as mentioned by Aziz. Every Uyghur has a story to tell of loss and disappearance of close family members. Uh, it's normal for Uyghurs to be growing up in atmosphere of uh, fear. Uh, everybody has had their family members uh, um, killed during political campaigns, disappeared, uh, tortured. Um, I think the state terrorism, it was shown by Joe's article that uh, uh, it's, it's apt to use in this situation. I think it's worth uh, to remember that Uyghurs have not been subjected to these uh, policies of Communist Party of China uh, since 1949, but they have been subjected to uh, sort of proto-communist policies already in since uh, at least 1937 uh, during the era of Sheng Shetai where uh, Xinjiang was viewed pretty or functioned pretty much as a protectorate run by uh, political commissars of the Communist Party of Soviet Union. So it was during this period when the first purges happened and uh, lots of elites, for example, perished in this purge. Um, these mental pressures extend uh, beyond the boundaries of People's Republic of China. Of People's Republic of China. So, for instance, uh, just one example to be quicker, or two, two examples maybe. Um, one informant in Kazakhstan informed me, inf uh, informed me or told me that after uh, people are released uh, from a re-education camp uh, of Kazakh uh, ethnicity and are allowed, in case they are allowed to Kazakhstan, it happens quite frequently that they are uh, practically immediately visited by the staff of a Chinese consulate uh, in Almaty and persuaded not to talk. Other uh, Uyghurs in, in Turkey, for example, frequently tell stories about their relatives being taken uh, in order to pressure them outside the boundaries to cooperate with secret service, etc. So these terror tactics extend beyond the boundaries. Another uh, important part of cultural genocide, I think, which is ongoing, is uh, the decimation of Uyghur uh, intellectual elites. And this is, in this case, uh, quite clearly is on grounds on their ethnicity because regardless of the degree of uh, their religious, uh, religious uh, profile, uh, regardless of the fact that many of these elites, uh, such as uh, Rahila Davut, as far as I'm informed, Abdul Qadir Jalaladin are Communist Party members, and as such are not allowed to practice religion, uh, regardless of the fact that many uh, so-called patriotic religious uh, figures also have been detained. So this implies that the target is actually the ethnic group in this particular concept. So the decimation of uh, intellectual elites, I think, is uh, one facet which can be established also pretty firmly based on data, which is happening today in Xinjiang. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, next up we have uh, Penny, Penny Green from Queen Mary. This would be it. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, I think that this is a really important conference and I'm really delighted to have been invited. Um, Unlike most people who've spoken today, I'm not an expert on China or Xinjiang or the Uyghur. Um, but what I hope to do is to give you a sense, perhaps, of uh, the lessons learned from an analysis of what has happened to the Rohingya, a Muslim minority in Myanmar, Burma. Um, and so I want to start by, um, I mean, of I, I, I like to start talks uh, on the Rohingya. Uh, with Aung San Suu Kyi and General Min Aung Lai, because these are the uh, authors uh, of the, the genocide, and these are the, the genocide. And we should never forget that uh, genocide takes place because of decisions made by uh, governments of this kind. Um, <clears throat> I want today to ground my thoughts uh, and, and, and discussion uh, in the field work that my team from the International State Crime Initiative and I conducted on Myanmar's genocide of the Rohingya. <clears throat> um, we, we did this 
field work inside Myanmar in 2013-14, and later uh, we went to the Bangladesh camps in Cox's Bazaar uh, in uh, November, uh, late October 2017, after, if you like, the sort of the denouement of the genocide. <clears throat> and I, I think that the framework that I want to, to give you now, a, a way of understanding genocide, is, is different from that adopted by many genocide scholars, um, because I don't really want to use a genocide convention. I think that there are a very significant problems with the convention, very significant problems with the international mechanisms of, of justice. Uh, and I want to begin by saying that I approach uh, what I'm talking about from a state crime perspective. My colleague Tony Ward um, and I de derived uh, a definition of, of state crime uh, in around 2000. Um, and that definition uh, is essentially human rights violations perpetrated by state agents in pursuit of a state organisational goal. I mean, that's important. It's not about individual gratification. The, these crimes and these deviant acts are, are taking place because they advance a particular state or government goal. <clears throat> so that's the general definition of state crime under which genocide, torture, war crimes and so on fall. Um, the, sorry, I forgot about the... <laughs> The, the, the slides. The, I'm drawing, okay, that's my starting point, but I also want to draw on the work of Raphael Lemkin, who of course coined the term genocide and, and was initial, he, 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 he was central to the framing of the Genocide Convention, though was deeply disappointed at its, in, it, in its final form. Uh, and I want to also talk about the work of Claudia Card uh, a little bit later when she talks about the idea of genocide as being the equivalent of social death. And finally, I want to use the work of Daniel Feirstein, who is an Argentinian scholar of genocide. And he talks about genocide as social practice. Um, and I think the most important point I want to, to, to make before I actually go into the detail <coughs> is that genocide needs to be understood as a process. It's not an event. It's not a simply event of spectacularised violence or an incident of mass killing. Genocide is a process and it takes place very often over decades. And I think that's what I've learnt this morning about the Uyghur. And it's certainly true of the genocide. That was a, that was a, a genocide which took place over some 35 years. Um, and so... We, we need to go back to, to Lemkin's original writings. Genocide does not necessarily mean the immediate destruction of a nation. It is intended rather to signify a coordinated plan of different actions aimed at the destruction of the essential foundations of the life of national groups with the, with the aim of annihilating the groups themselves. And annihilation can take place in ways other than mass killing. Uh, though mass killing is very frequently uh, a result of genocidal practices and policies. Um, and I think one of the things that Lemkin made clear, you know, in, in both the quote that Andre gave and, and um, this one, is that genocide needs to be planned. It's not something spontaneous. It's not the product of communal violence. It, it's planned by states. And this is what General Minong Lai said. I think it was in around 2015, but I'd have to um, um, check that. The Bengali problem, I mean, because in, it's, it's worth noting, uh, and we talked about suppression of the Uyghur and the Uyghur culture, uh, the word Rohingya is not allowed to be used inside um, Myanmar, Burma. And in fact, Aung San Suu Kyi instructed the American ambassador in 2015 that um, <clears throat> the, the word was not to be used. Instead, these we were talking about people who believed in Islam who lived in Rakhine State. Uh, so he said the Bengali problem, because that's what the uh, Myanmar state calls the Rohingya, uh, the Bengali problem was a long-standing one which had become, has become an unfinished job. It's finished now, but this was prior to 2017. It has become an unfinished job despite the efforts of the previous governments to solve it. The government in office is taking great care in solving the problem. <clears throat> now... In terms of understanding genocide as a process, I'm using Fierstein stages because I think they're really helpful. Um, they, they, they go one to six, but they often run concurrently. 
Um, and I won't say much about some of the early ones because time is very short, but I want to give some sense, in fact, time is very short. Um, so it starts with stigmatisation, is othering a particular targeted group. We move then to, once you've targeted and othered a group, it becomes easier to assault them. It becomes easier to hurt them because they aren't like us, they're different to us. Um, <clears throat> and they're somehow less human. Um, sorry, I'll go back to the... And once you've begun the physical violence, and with, the, with the respect to the Rohingya in 2012, mass violence against the Rohingya led to them fleeing the capital city of Rakhine State, Sitwe, and ending up in an area which is now a detention camp complex. We think about the camps in Bangladesh, but actually there are horrendous camps inside Myanmar, in Rakhine State, where Rohingya have been languishing since 2012. So that once they're isolated in camps, and there's one ghetto in Sitwe, and in what we call prison villages, it's much easier to systematically weaken them through the denial of the right to health care, the denial of a right to education, the denial of an opportunity to earn a livelihood. Uh, and this has severe uh, mental health implications, of course, the, the, as Andre was talking about earlier and Joe implied. Um, once you've systematically weakened a group, it becomes much easier to annihilate them. But I think it's important to bring Claudia Card in here. She's a, a social theorist who talks about social death. Genocide is a form of social death. And she says what distinguishes genocide is not that it has a different kind of victim, namely groups, uh, although it's a convenient shorthand to speak of targeting groups, rather the kind of harm suffered by individual victims in virtue of their group membership is not captured by other crimes. Um, I'm going to move quite quickly uh, to give you a sense of, this, this, the, of, what, of what this looks like, of what social death looks like. These image, this is the first image of the Rohingya. Oh, my time is up. So this is, I'm going to really rush, but this is an image of the Rohingya as they fled Myanmar um, in 2015. And, and these are the camps inside Myanmar, just to give you a sense. They are in a much worse situa situation than the camps in Bangladesh. Um, and I, I'm not going to talk about it now because my time is up, but I want to leave you with the thought about genocide's final stage. Mass annihilation is not the final stage of genocide. It's rewriting the histories, engaging the denial um, of, the, of, the, of the state in which the genocide has taken place. It's about the destruction of the old society. It's about the eradication from history of the targeted group. Uh, it's about the creation of a new society, demographic changes and so on. I'll talk about that in the, um, in the, uh, um, in the discussion, but I want to show you this final picture of Indin village. Indin's really interesting because this is a very clear example of the way in which um, the country is being reorganised. Uh, this was a mixed Rohingya and Rakhine village, uh, and these are the Rakhine homes. This was where the Rohingya lived. They, they were all destroyed in 2017. Uh, and since 2017, you can see these are, there are all red roofs there, and these are now security establishments. Um, and I think I'm going to leave it here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks to all of the three speakers for um, very rich presentations that um, uh, opened up uh, the concept of uh, genocide, of state crime. And um, I think um, uh, I, I would like to maybe take the privilege of um, uh, putting one or two very short questions out to you. Um, but I imagine I'm sure that we will have a, um, a discussion um, uh, a, a lively discussion uh, later on. So um, I think that um, uh, uh, picking up directly, perhaps starting with um, what we just heard um, from uh, Penny Green about um, the kind of stages of genocide um, 
uh, I think that uh, it does seem to throw up, and this would really be a question to the first two speakers, it does seem to um, raise the, the question of where, if we use those stages, and in particular, if we engage with this notion of um, uh, the kind of final enactment of genocide as um, creating a, a sort of the destruction of um, the vestiges of a culture of a nation, of whether that resonates with uh, your understanding of um, what is happening, um, for instance, thinking of Joe's uh, description of the destruction of graveyards and um, religious buildings and so on and so forth. Um, uh, uh, so I, that would be a question to, to both of you, to how you would uh, react to, to this kind of um, portrayal of stages. Um, my question, I suppose, um, especially to Penny, but in some ways to um, all of you, because all of you have opted to work with conceptions of genocide that quite explicitly reject the definitions of um, the Genocide Convention or indeed of the Rome Statute. Um, is there not, um, uh, and, and just maybe to put that into the room, um, uh, you, uh, when we look at those uh, international criminal law definitions, um, uh, then it is true that uh, they essentially uh, provide um, a number of different types of state acts. Um, uh, mass killings, um, uh, but not only mass killings, also the infliction of uh, serious bodily or mental harm, as Andre mentioned, um, uh, and um, uh, uh, various other kinds of actions, but then uh, they also um, require the Genocide Convention um, defines genocide as um, a behavior that is done with a very specific intent, the intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnic, racial or religious group. And um, uh, I think you, all the three of you, basically decided not to work with um, that narrowing definition. Um, uh, so my question to you would be, um, uh, is that the case? And then if so, uh, why? Why not use um, international criminal law definitions? And um, uh, what about those me the mechanisms that international criminal law might provide? <laughs> Thank you. I'm just waiting for my laptop to warm up. So um, I need a slide on there. But just, I have been using, uh, I have been looking at the UN. I know. Convention on Genocide. Um, that was the first thing I went to. Well, no, the first thing I went to was Raphael Lemkin, the same quote that you just put up on your slide there, Penny. Um, and the next thing I did was was to look at the UN Gen Genocide Convention. Um, and I think I was trying I was trying to plot what's happening in Xinjiang against Article Two, the, the various provisions in Article Two of that convention. And what you find is that the the first point of mass killings is obviously difficult in the Xinjiang case for all sorts of reasons. One, one is that we can't know how many people are dying. It's extremely difficult to know how many people are dying. I think um, the, my tentative conclusion at the moment about mass killings in Xinjiang is that I think there have been moments where we could, where there have been what Bradley Campbell would call a proto-genocide. So this is, he talks about a spectrum of genocide with proto-genocide at the lesser end and hyper-genocide at the greater end and a hyper genocide of course an example of that would be the jewish holocaust but a proto genocide would be something like and i suggest this very tentatively and open to argument about it but uh, would be something like the yeken massacre as it's become known from 2014 where we had we don't know the numbers exactly but anything between one and three thousand uyghurs in in elishku village um or elishku township um killed by by state forces that that would qualify under bradley campbell's definition which is not a legal scholarly definition it's an academic definition but that would qualify as a proto-genocide however if you look at the other points under article two of the convention the genocide convention then um it does fit and andre was did did actually speak to that just now the part about um mental harm physical and mental harm there are very very many examples of physical and mental harm now being perpetrated in in, in xinjiang and i i don't know whether it's possible to prosecute using the using the genocide convention without the mass killing aspect um do, or do you need the mass killing aspect as well 
I, I'm sorry, maybe that I didn't make myself clear, but I think that where um, often um, uh, the, the argument sort of um, fails or runs into difficulty is um, uh, in terms of establishing it intent, mm -hmm. genocidal intent. Um, uh, so you can show that yeah. all these terrible acts are being perpetrated mm -hmm. by a state, um, but can you also actually show that um, uh, this is done with the intent to destroy in whole or in part um, a national group, a racial group, uh, uh, or a religious group? Um, that, that tends to be where yes. it, it fails. Yes, yeah, so, so the intent is really difficult to prove. Mm -hmm. um, the mass killings are really difficult to evidence if, where, when and if, you know, if and when they are happening. Um, I think the, the mental harm is easier to prove at the moment. We have a lot of testimonies um, from former camp survivors via, for example, the Xinjiang Victims Database. Um, but um, the main problem that I discovered, and the reason why I've kind of moved away a bit from the convention, was that um, China has um, lodged a reservation, essentially. It, it, it has signed up to the UN Genocide Convention, um, in, in 1949, I think July, I think it was just before the, the establishment of the PRC, but um, they've, established, they've lodged a reservation, and Reservation 2 says um, we do not recognise Article 9. Article 9 in the Genocide Convention basically means uh, it's a provision to refer a dispute over the interpretation of the Genocide Convention to the International Court of Justice. China doesn't recognise that article which means if China, China disputes the interpretation, which of course it will, we can't ask the ICJ to adjudicate. So it's a complete non-starter as far as I can see, I'm, but I'm not, a, I'm not a lawyer, so I'll let the lawyers comment on that. Thank you. Important question. I think uh, I'm not a lawyer, so just uh, to get back to the... <laughs> Uh, the, the convention, I, I always thought reading the text means any of the following acts with intent. Mm. So the intent is a really important word. I think, um, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, I'm, I'm not sure what constitutes what's, what from from legal point of view, but uh, the way I, um, I'm reading or the way I understand the official documents and the policy, the policies, I think there is a clear intent of the state to... Uh, terminate the existence of Uyghur with its identity features, with its culture, language, religious practices as they exist now and replace them with something else. And I think this constitutes an intent to destroy what Uyghurs themselves think they are. I think uh, uh, in general terms, I think uh, identity of a person is not what the government says. You know, I think Uyghurs who are, who although do have still written in their Shenfenjiang, the category, Weiwur, Zhu, etc., but in fact cannot practice Islam, cannot choose the name they want, cannot uh, speak Uyghur language at school, cannot listen to Uyghur uh, songs and, uh, and dances because all the singers are in re-education camps. They cannot go to a cemetery or a shrine, etc. I don't think the Uyghurs would, or human beings, would think of themselves as human beings able to call themselves Uyghur under these terms. That's how I understand it. And I think this intent to end what Uyghurs are now and replace it with, some, with something else is clearly there, has been there for decades. Um, thank you. Yes, I, I think that the... Part of the problem with a legal approach to genocide is that there's an attempt to decouple um, politics from law. And genocides are ultimately political. It's not about the law. I mean, states break laws all the time, and genocide is a, a very clear example of that. But all the component parts that Andre has just mentioned are, are, are clear um, examples of that. And so I think that we, it, it's not helpful to frame genocide legally um, because, A, I don't think it helps us understand the processes, as I talked about earlier, but it certainly isn't part of the solution. Well, if it's, a part, if it's part of the solution, it's a, a tiny part of the solution. So at the moment, the Gambia has taken uh, the Myanmar state to the International Court of Justice uh, on grounds of genocide. 
Um, and they have, the, the, the result was that the International Court of Justice said that the Myanmar state must uh, put in place provisional measures to prevent acts of genocide taking place against uh, the Rohingya. Now, most of the Rohingya are gone. Um, the genocide has happened. Um, and what the court has said is simply abide by the genocide convention. There's nothing new in the provisions, uh, the measures that the International Court of Justice has demanded that the Myanmar state abide by. And so I think the, the commitment to legal solutions is, is distracting. It's very time consuming. Uh, genocides, I mean, when we did our work, we published a report in 2015. It was my final slide. I didn't get a chance to show you. Um, but when we published our report, we sent it to Boris Johnson, who was then you know, the head of, um, he was Minister for Foreign Affairs. Um, the reply we got back from his office was, well, it's not a genocide until a court of law determines it's a genocide. And when do we see um, attempts to take uh, genocide to court? It's always after the event. It's always after the event. And so I, I think we have to think really carefully about, about sort of um, reifying the law and what the law can do. I think it can be a rhetorical tool. And certainly the, for the Rohingya, the decision of um, the Gambia to take Myanmar to the International Court of Justice was a great boost. It was a recognition that they existed and a recognition that great harms had been done. So at that level, I think it's very important. But, but please don't rely on legal solutions because you'll be waiting decades. And they won't be solutions because the damage will have well, a long, long, long been done. Well, uh, thank you very much. That was, a, I think, very clear answer. And I think that um, this is of relevance, not least because even though, of course, it's true that um, the international um, tribunals are not actually available um, in the Chinese case anyway, um, uh, nevertheless, there are discussions, so far as I understand, about um, raising the issue of criminal liability, for instance, through uh, mechanisms of universal jurisdiction in a particular country. And um, so if I take it, if I get it right, then this panel um, would not particularly advise um, uh, civil society groups to pursue that route, um, uh, but rather advise um, uh, uh, those of us who are interested in thinking about potential responses uh, to what is happening, um, to uh, use other strategies, exposing I suppose the, the, the political liability uh, that, that, that China has, or maybe um, using other potential legal routes um, for pursuing legal liability of, uh, be it the Chinese state or potentially complicit um, other governments or other entities. Um, if, 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 if I get the mood of the panel right, um, that, 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 that might be your response. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to open up for questions. Um, uh, uh, yes, please. Um, lady in, in green, thank you. Um, well, well, thank you. you. Oh, is it me? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Him or me? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Me. In green. You're wearing the wrong colour clothes there. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I think that this is really, really crucial, the discussion on this panel. And, you know, maybe we'll... Ref we'll return to thinking about the political implications of an acceptance of the um, comments of the first two speakers in particular. But I did find Penny Green's um, argument about thinking about genocide as a process very, very helpful indeed. I've got a couple of comments and a question. The first comment is that I think that we need to be very cautious in thinking about um, in terms of a revival of cultural revolution type totalitarianism. Rahima this morning noted the difference in her view, the difference between what happened in the cultural revolution and now, and I have a lot of sympathy for the view she put forward. Now we're talking about the global circulation of surveillance capitalism and the complicity of global corporations with that in what China is doing. 
um, and through an incredibly invasive use of surveillance technology, which in terms of its political economy, as long as uh, including its reach, is way beyond anything that Mao and the Cultural Revolution could imagine doing. So I think we very need to be very, very cautious in thinking about the Cultural Revolution in a media um, environment in which um, thoughtless journalists too happily and too easily make reference to the suppression of the Mao era. I, you know, speaking as a historian, I just think that we need to be careful about that. However, there is a question that nobody has yet raised. I mean, the Chinese state has been um, undertaking a process of Hanification of Xinjiang for decades. And I would like the panel's view about whether what is happening now, we can think of it as a qualitatively different stage, or is it something that continues from policies in the past? I would also like to make a, a comment about gender. Um, I wanted to make that this morning. I mean, the reference this morning in Rahima's um, talk to the use of rape um, and incarceration of women was horrifying in the extreme. And Joe refers to the coercive marriage of, of Uyghur women to Han men and with that kind of distressing photograph. And I just want to say that you know, violence comes in many, many different forms. State terrorism comes in many, many different forms. And its gendered dimension is extremely important. And we shouldn't forget that. So thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm so sorry, I didn't realize that both Harriet and Jude actually are wearing green. So Jude Howe, <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> please. Yeah, I'll be quick. I mean, my question is for this panel, and it relates to what happened before, but we're, we're sort of positioning, you know, Han versus Uyghur, state, uh, Chinese state versus Uyghur in Xinjiang. And I, I would like to bring in um, the concept of civil society, because I think civil society can be recruited into this state plan, or it can be a form of resistance. And we've we've sort of normatively assumed it's going to be a form of resistance, but actually none of this would be possible without also some complicity um, on the part of civil society. We see on the one hand the destruction, when you're talking about genocide of um, um, certain institutions in Xinjiang, which are part of the uh, identity of culture, of, of Uyghurs, but um, you know what? The, there must be civil society organisations, non—I don't want to use hand—but I mean, which are also being recruited into the idea, into this idea, just as there are with the prevent model or other models. So, I, if you have any thoughts on that, I'd be very interested to know, because it's not so uh, chalk and cheese as as presented. Excellent. Can we perhaps take one more question? Um, yes, please. Oh, sorry. I'm oh, sorry. The, the, yes, thank you. Thank you very much, panelists, for enlightening us about genocide, torture, and mass murders. There are three countries in the world who are culprits, China, India, and Myanmar, or used to be Burma. Now, the definition of uh, torture is fully explained in the United Nations Charter. Now, you as a scholar and academics define what torture and mass murder is, but where is the United Nations not intervening in these instances? There is a genocide process going on in India. In Kashmir, there is a lockdown for seven months, and the women are being raped, and mass murder is taking place. Political leaders are taken into custody. 1,000 political leaders in Kashmir are in prison. Narendra Modi's government in India watching when Donald Trump was visiting India. L lot of people were killed in front of the police. S little children were snatched from the mother's lap. They were thrown in the fire. And the women were uh, murdered in front of police. So you haven't mentioned India's uh, terrorism, and I wholeheartedly agree with Fanny Green how she described genocide. At least two million Muslims in India at the risk of ethnically cleansed. 
and nobody in the West is intervening. When you talk to India, their, their diplomacy is internal affairs. Genocide is not an internal affair. It is an international crime. India is guilty of crime against humanity. An academic argument will not solve this problem until America, Britain, EU, other countries in the Western countries intervene. In China, in Myanmar, and in India, three culprits country, and we are watching as a human being. I cannot sleep at night when I see the video. Uh, I haven't slept actually since the uh, daily riots, you know, and they, how people are cut with a sword. Their fathers, mothers, sw sword cut their uh, head and they burn. They burn their houses, they burn their shops. And when they go back there, they say, why have you come here? If you come here in your own house, it will happen again, the same thing. Communal, right is not, communal riots are not new in India. So nobody actually is talking about it. You see. Are you afraid of India? Thank you. OK, thank you very much. I would like to give um, the panelists an opportunity to reply to get back to these points. Um, um, uh, so okay. uh, I'm happy to start on civil society. Um, um, because that was the first project I was doing inside Myanmar, which uh, in 2012, and that was how we first learnt about uh, what was what was going on in Rakhine State. And I think that your the the point that you made about civil society and the ambiguity of civil society is really important. We tend to think of civil society as being uh, human rights based, as 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 an ultimately a, a force for good, uh, but in my research, that's not always the case. Sadly, um, very often civil society can be a force for reaction, uh, and in Myanmar, that was the case. So in Myanmar, uh, part of the problem for the Rohingya was that they were completely alone inside the country. Uh, because civil society, if you like, had been captured effectively, uh, certainly ideologically, by, um, by, the, by the, the, the military regime and then by the NLD and Aung San Suu Kyi in terms of um, the, the sort of stigmatisation perceptions of, of, of what the Rohingya were. That, that is, that they were potentially terrorist force, that they were uh, illegal Bengali immigrants, uh, that they uh, were business monopolizers and all of the kind of racial stereotypes that are used against Muslims inside the country. So it's very true that, um, that, that civil society is not an unproblematic force. However, um, I think it is our best way forward. I think if we are thinking about how we might try to intervene, and part of the reason for appreciating the stages of genocide is that it gives us moments of intervention. So it's one of the reasons why, when we see the, the, the appalling treatment that our own government is, is giving to asylum seekers, this is a lot, these alarm bells have to, have to ring because these are the points at which, when groups are stigmatised, we need to, to intervene. Um, and so I think that despite the problematic nature of civil society, it's, we only know about what's going on in places like Xinjiang and Rakhine State and Delhi because of the forces of civil society, because of international NGOs, because of independent journalism and so on. So I think it's about how we work with those groups um, and um, that can be problematic, but I, I do think that it is our, by far and away our best way forward and, and it's about unifying struggles. It's about bringing the, you know, one of the, the opportunities I think today would be to bring the Uyghur together. There are no, I don't know that there are any Rohingya in the audience here. And so it seems to me that the Uyghur and the Rohingya, the Kachin, um, these are the groups that should be working together in a unified way to take on these terrible challenges. Thank you so much. Any comments from you on these points? I might also allow myself a point on civil society. Uh, OK. Uh, I will react to the culture revolution just briefly. I think uh, uh, 
Uh, I think uh, I was referring more to the style of leadership and style of the policy. I don't think things are happening in the exactly the same way, but I think at the same time, a lot of approaches are being reintroduced by, by the Chinese leadership, either explicitly or implicitly by, by during the C era. Uh, and, uh, but uh, I think um, regarding honeyfication, uh, I don't think uh, honeyfication nowadays is a qualitatively a new stage. I think that was the question, right? If I, if I. No, it's not a qualitatively new stage. Uh, it might be new as far as the extent of it, the implementation is, is happening now, but it's not qualitatively new stage. I think the first policy intention of uh, Hanification of uh, Xinjiang are from uh, 1820s. Uh, Laura Newby's research, uh, uh, the Empire and the Hanet, I think, uh, as far as um, if I remember correctly, she outlines the policy change in 1820s. And that, that's when the first uh, Hanification, Hanification uh, um, idea started at the time. So qualitatively, no, it's not, not uh, new nowadays. Also, 1950s saw a rise in population of Han, Han, um, Han people in Xinjiang. Um, on the gender question, um, I think the Uyghurs themselves have experienced what's, what's happening to them in gender terms for, for quite some time. So, for example, I did work with some Xiaojie, um, Uyghur hostess girls who were um, sitting, singing karaoke, karaoke um, smoking, drinking with Han businessmen, Han Chinese businessmen in karaoke bars in, in Urumqi. And that whole situation was was conceived in ethno-political terms within the Uyghur community so the girls were very stigmatized the men would spit at them in the street and if they saw them coming out of a karaoke club would would abuse them and hit them sometimes um, according to my interviews with the girls and and it was very much a situation where the Uyghur women were seen as the culture bearers and and the Uyghur women had to be protected against Han male uh, encroachment uh, and it was only by doing that that um, the Uyghur nation could be rescued or, or shored up, as it, as it were. Um, and now, at the moment, in the internment camps, then, yeah, I think women, women, are, women are being targeted in all sorts of gendered ways. So you've got, you've got testimonies from survivors talking about um, having been given some white liquid to drink, which has caused their menstruation to stop, for example. Um, we have we have the the grueling stories of, of rape, uh, as Raima mentioned earlier. Um, we also have stories from people who got out of the camps of forced sterilizations uh, and forced abortions. And um, I wanted to ask Raima earlier, but I didn't want to take up the floor space. But uh, if rape is happening on a on a very regular basis in the internment camps, how does that link in with the forced abortions? Are, are women falling pregnant from these rapes? Is that leading to more forced abortions or is it the case that they're being fed things to stop their menstruation so that they can be raped without any kind of effect? You know, um, there are some really troubling questions that emerge from that from that situation. Thank you so much. If I might just abuse the um, chair's privilege um, to get back on the question about civil society with one very brief further comment. Um, as a researcher who has spent many years... Uh, so my question about Kashmir, about Indian terrorism, state terrorism well, India. So I did... did to yes, um, thank you, sir. So I think that uh, nobody, none of the panelists particularly wanted to take up this point. Um, a very question, brief... They, they can answer the question. <laughs> uh, could I just say, I, you know, I would not avoid it. I mean, if, if I, I mean, I, we talk about what we best know. Mm -hmm. And I, I agree with you, sir. I'm sorry? I, 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 allow me to mention that, I mean, this panel is focusing on um, the situation in uh, Xinjiang. But Dibiesh has a point? Okay. Uh, 
I, I want to just speak on behalf of the organizers, although I don't personally know them. I don't think you were here this morning. I write about women, Kashmir, India, Delhi, Hindutva project. And this morning there was a detailed presentation at which I spoke. So the first session, if you look through the program, was actually addressing this question and taking on board exactly everything that you said. So we have actually at length spoken about India. And the, Thank you very the, and much. And about Kashmir as well. And there will be a... <laughs> okay. There will be a video available that you can watch later. Very good point. Okay, excellent. I think that we need to... Yeah. Thank you very much, but I think that I would, I would very much like to continue um, the panel discussion and allow me just to... Thank you. Um, allow me to get back on the point about civil society. Um, I think that um, speaking as someone who's done many years of research working with um, uh, human rights advocates uh, in, in China, in sort of mainland China, uh, I would just like to point out, and I think this is important, that yes, of course, society can be highly collusive and supportive of um, uh, practices that we can call genocidal, that are certainly, from my perspective, crimes against humanity that are awful. But I would like to say that China, of course, is as a whole, a highly repressive system. Uh, Chinese society, Chinese human rights advocates included, um, uh, live with huge risks. And um, it is very difficult uh, from within Chinese society to raise um, persecution and in particular to raise um, the crimes against humanity uh, that are occurring in Xinjiang. And I think that it is important to make this point um, uh, just to sort of contextualize um, because um, if we compare across different systems, then the degree to which the state is repressive, of course, will really affect uh, the ability of any kind of civil society and in China it is quickly vanishing as we speak um, uh, to actually oppose and challenge um, uh, severe crimes like this. Uh, to give one example, some two, three weeks ago, I uh, did receive a message and I was um, kind of impressed um, from a, a human rights lawyer who shall be nameless, um, uh, directly pointing out um, to what was described as crimes uh, occurring in Xinjiang, uh, that person at the time of writing this was under the heaviest possible surveillance and they are currently recovering from uh, their own experience of forced disappearance and torture. And um, it is difficult uh, for Chinese civil society in particular to, to raise the issues um, in Xinjiang, severe um, uh, as they are and much as they of course require to be, um, to be raised and to be challenged. That's partly, I think, why we're trying to have this panel looking into um, possible responses um, uh, uh, also from outside of China. One more point by Andre, and then perhaps we can continue. I apologize. Thank you. Also on the note of civil society, similar experience. I've spoken to a, a journalist from a, one of the more, um, let's say, more open, um, non-state-owned media in China, which are occasionally allowed an investigative report. And she told me that reporting about Xinjiang is entirely off limits, even for the slightly more liberal Chinese language, uh, Eastern or Southern China-based media. Thank you so much. So I think we had a question here and then uh, behind you. Yes, please. Um, lady in, in black. Thank you. Thank you so much for the panel and this entire, whole entire day. I've been learning very much. Um, so I just wanted to ask a question in regards to the necessity to condemn the cultural genocide, but also echoing the idea of um, the international solidarity that needs to be fostered. Um, obviously, there is a difficulty well, they do condemn them regardless, but there's a difficulty for nations like the US to condemn China because it would be quite hypocritical, particularly considering their own Guantanamo Bay and all their human rights violations. And I think um, I'm sort of trying to look at the social media narrative um, in regards to the, the Uyghurs um, for my own dissertation. And a key argument by the Chinese as seen on social media tends to be that this is the West trying to impose the war and terror narrative onto their own nations to increase 
further control um, as we see this turn to a multipolar world order. But also, this isn't about relativity and all violations are violations and there's no excuses. So I just wanted to ask um, a more practical question. Um, how do we as part of leading institutions and the wider civil society go on about condemnation such that we're able to minimize these loopholes and spaces for Xi Jinping and other authoritarian governments to refute their own crimes against humanity via justification that the global north too is engaging in equally horrendous actions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, yeah. Um, so I think I have a question on, because I think you kind of touch upon ways of stopping uh, the genocide in Xinjiang. I know this is probably going to be addressed in later panels, but I just want to come back on your kind of understanding and what I got from it. Um, kind of the idea that mobilizing international public opinion, international civil society um, was kind of raising awareness might be the best way to stop uh, what's happening in Xinjiang. Uh, I mean, just to me, it seems debatable that uh, non-coercive measures would be able to stop China, uh, especially knowing that it's an authoritarian, highly secretive, economically powerful state. So I'd like to have a bit more of your insight on how exactly that those types of mechanisms would help prevent or stop what's happening right now and also my other point would be that isn't like focusing on international society ngos academics like yourselves as being kind of people who can act on and stop uh, genocide isn't that kind of taking away the responsibility states do have and states especially states that have signed the convention to prevent and punish genocide and that are not doing anything currently um so i just want to have a bit of your opinion on that Thank you very much. And then we have um, some input from uh, Sophia Woodman. Thank you so Yes. Much. Well, not from me, from the... Um, <laughs> there's a very lively chat on the live stream. Um, but uh, um, maybe you can read it, some of it. But um, I mean, summing up one question is, isn't this just about um, sort of separatism and the fight against separatism and we're, we're kind of masking it with this discussion of all these other things. So, well, I'm not going to try and sum that up, but, um, but there is a quite specific um, question from one of our um, remote audience, which is, um, in contrast to the Rohingya, the Uyghurs are recognized as an ethnic group in China officially. Um, and um, the Chinese government, ha ha while they're trying to reshape this, the identity of the group, they're not trying to eliminate the group per se. So does that make a difference in terms of thinking of it as genocidal or not? Thank you very much. So now we have a collection of questions. Um, uh, who would like to um, speak to the last questions from the media discussion? Who would like to make a start? Can I speak Thank you. Separatism? Just a quick word about separatism. What's really noticeable in the last few years? I, I've been I've been talk, interviewing Uyghurs about separatism since since the mid '90s, when it was there was quite a lively debate about. Xinjiang independence, you know, and people were, Uyghurs were talking about, you know, will the new state be called Uyghuristan or will it be called East Turkestan or what, what will it be called? And it was all very exciting, you know, and it was lots of young men were having this conversation in Xinjiang. But at the same time as that going on, I would say probably a greater proportion of the population were not talking about independence. What's very noticeable about the last two or three years in the context of re-education and mass internment is that now, Everyone without exception is saying the only way to solve this current problem is independence. Um, any, um, uh, I would also like to um, remark on separatism because this is something that, uh, that uh, um, appears quite often, uh, fight against separatism, fight against terrorism, and fight against extremism, so-called three, three forces. I think uh, both, uh, or it, um, the, the analysis of, for example, the violent incidents, uh, articles by Pavlo in, in your volume, uh, work by uh, Sean Roberts. Pablo uh, Rodriguez Marino. Right. Sorry, excuse me. Um, book, uh, the, the final chapter, or think, uh, or the appendix of uh, Gardner Bovingdon's book, uh, Sean Roberts' uh, 
articles, they show that uh, the incident, the violent incidents actually overwhelmingly small majority are um, related to terrorism or acts of terrorism in the sense of an attack on um, the public, on civilians, on unarmed civilians. Uh, also, um, I think Pavlo also wrote a really interesting article uh, on how the labeling, label, label of the uh, internal political enemy evolves uh, from um, separatists to terrorists to current day extremists. Uh, I've read several uh, English language uh, official statements from, from past months. Uh, now, uh, another, the, new, the term that seems to be uh, also appearing in interrelation with separatism, terrorism, extremism in the official propaganda is violence. So this is the fourth concept used very inconsistently in my way, uh, in, my, in my opinion. Um, so I think uh, at least do things uh, refute the argument about separatism and terrorism. Uh, also, small remark uh, on Guantanamo. I'm, I'm not sure what specifically you meant by this comparison. But, uh, um, yeah, would you like to specify? Because, or uh, let me put it this way. Uh, I'm not trying to argue uh, that the uh, United States government is not hypocritical. But uh, if, if we <laughs> compare <laughs> Guantanamo and contemporary situation in Xinjiang, we do find similarities, but we find overwhelmingly differences. For example, the scale of detention. You know, Guantanamo had uh, 800 people uh, at the start, which was the largest number of detainees there are. Uh, it's an illegal detention facility. But uh, on the other hand, there are quite a number of people detained there who were detained fighting. Uh, there are uh, so-called high-value detainees who were organizers of several very violent terrorist incidents. Um, the, um, there are in people who were detained innocently in both facilities. At the same time, uh, people in Guantanamo are free to practice Islam. They have access to lawyers uh, and uh, they can communicate with their families. Uh, so to say, so I think uh, there are also a lot of differences in, in the comparison. Thank you so much. There was one question on civil society. Yeah, I'll, I'll, yes. I'll come back to that one. Thank you. Um, uh, two points. You, you also, I'm going to start with the second, whereas you, you said, well, if, if you're putting, a, putting the pressure on civil society to take responsibility for dealing with genocide, doesn't that remove responsibility or, or absolve states from the responsibility of dealing with genocide? I mean, states have, have demonstrated very, very clearly that they will not take responsibility for, for dealing with genocide. And one of the reasons is um, the, the, the very term genocide. You see that states will not use the term genocide, not until there is, <laughs> there's, no, there's no possibility for them not to. Because once states use the term and accept that a genocide is taking place, they are under an obligation, whether or not you, you see it as a significant obligation, um, by the, the Genocide Convention to intervene to prevent uh, and to punish. Now, obviously the second element, to punish, is much easier because it's after the event, right? Uh, states are, have, have shown themselves to have remo no remote interest at all in intervening to prevent genocide. Uh, and, and I think that's important and it, it also speaks to some problematic decisions that, that some of the major international NGOs have taken. Um, so Amnesty International still call what happened to the Rohingya and, and describe Myanmar as an apartheid state. Uh, Human Rights Watch talk about crimes against humanity because they are they themselves are, are fairly significant major players, major, and, and have strong relationships with states uh, and with corporations. Which comes back to my the point I want to make about what else can civil society do, and I think you follow the money. So one of the most effective ways of trying to, to tackle the genocide and the consequences of genocide is to place sanctions, boycotts, divestment strategies against those who profit from genocide. 
Um, and so that will be in relation to corporations and governments. And we only need to look at the effect of the BDS campaign and the, the violent response that Israel has initiated against BDS, BDS activists and the BDS movement generally to see how effective those campaigns can be. And, and perhaps precisely on that point, what we, we might also um, want to think about the broader context um, discussed earlier today of forced labor and the economic interest uh, that is implicated in that, um, uh, raising the question whether civil society has strategies um, to um, uh, expose complicity, uh, for instance, corporate complicity, perhaps also government agency complicity with uh, those kinds of human rights violations as a way for um, uh, uh, sort of uh, at least raising the issue, but perhaps also as a as an effective way of um, stopping some of the behavior that supports um, uh, these ongoing uh, crimes, uh, state crimes, crimes against uh, humanity, or in a broader definition, the ongoing genocide uh, in, in the Xinjiang Uyghur uh, Autonomous Region. Um, I'm afraid that uh, we have gone way over time, and so we will have to um, have a, a shortened uh, tea break um, before we continue with um, a last uh, part of uh, today's conference, which um, will um, address um, uh, further address and more, address more explicitly um, the kind of sort of practical and advocacy um, uh, aspects uh, of this topic. Um, I'm sure that you will want to um, join me in uh, thanking the panelists and also once more thanking um, the organizers, um, including in particular Rachel and Sophia, but also uh, very much uh, Tim Pringle. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.